Hello, dear teachers. My name is Tania Jimenez from TaniaTeacherTraining.com and today we will be talking about how to implement the lexical approach, some principles and how to use it in your classroom. Okay, so stay with me if you want to know more. Let's start, teachers. First of all, what is Lexis? Lexis is vocabulary, right? It's all, all the words, all the, the idiomatic combinations in a language. That is Lexis, all the vocabulary that we have in our language or another language, okay? But what is the lexical approach? The lexical approach tells us that language consists of chunks of language that produce continuous coherent, coherent text, okay? So we need to make combinations of those chunks of language in order to produce continuous coherent text. Okay, so we have an important question here. Why is it important to use or to work with chunks of language? Take a look at this teacher. If I want to teach the word make, you know the meaning of make, the original meaning of make, okay? What is it more useful for students? To teach them make, just one isolated word, or to teach them this, make up a story. Mm -hmm. She loves to make up stories. Make it up to you. Well, I couldn't come yesterday, but I promise I will make it up to you. Or you really make me happy. If we work with all these chunks of language, student is going to have a wealth of knowledge a wealth of vocabulary, and he's going to learn it faster because it will be contextualized. He's going to have more tools learning all this than learning just the original meaning of make. So let's see how we can work with uh, chunks of language. First of all, we need to know the four categories of chunks of language. Um, the lexical approach was designed by Michael Lewis, and he tells us that there are four main categories. First category is words, normal isolated words that we know that come in any dictionary, okay? We're not going to go into detail with words because we already know them. We already know how this works. The word um, table, interview, happiness, etc. There are other categories, fixed expressions, collocations, and semi-fixed expressions. Let's see all of them. Let's begin with collocations. What is a collocation? Collocations are, are words that normally happen together. They co-occur together, okay? We have, for example, here, the verb have. The verb have, well, the, the normal meaning, the original meaning is possession, right? Possess something. But what about have a drink here? Have a drink. I don't possess the drink. What I mean by I had my coffee is I drank my coffee, right? So the meaning changes. These are words that normally happen together. We have, we find the word have together with a bath. Have a bath, have a drink, have a good time, have a haircut, have a holiday, etc. Or let's take, for example, the word pay. Pay, well, you give money in exchange for something. That is the original meaning. But let's take a look at these other collocations. Pay a fine, pay attention, pay someone a compliment, pay someone a visit, then the meaning changes. So it means, a collocation means that we have two or more words that normally go together. That creates a collocation. There are strong, there are strong collocations, there are weak collocations. These are just some examples, and this is the first category. Well, the second, actually, because the first one is um, words, and this is the second one. Now, the third one, fixed expressions. In fixed expressions, we cannot change a single word within the expression. We have, for example, social greetings, such as good morning, goodbye, how are you doing, etc. Then we have politeness phrases, such as, no, thank you, I am fine, uh, I better keep going, um, etc. Okay, 
and then we find idioms. As we know, they are idiomatic expressions, expressions that we cannot translate literally into another language because it won't make any meaning. It won't have any meaning. Okay. For example, to smell a rat. I smell a rat in here. Mm, that means that I sense something is wrong. Or uh, to chicken out. She chickened out and she didn't want to know anything about anything because she was so scared. To back out because of fear. That is the meaning. So idioms are part of fixed expressions. That is another category. Now, semi-fixed expressions. In this case, we can change one or two words for some possible um, alternatives. But we don't have so many alternatives. We don't have a lot. Let's see some examples. It's okay or that's okay or it was okay, it'll be okay. We can only change for a couple of words, but the idea remains the same. Mm -hmm. That's why they are semi-fixed expressions. Now, another one. Could you tell me, please? Could you tell me the time, please? Could you tell me the truth? Could you tell me, um, could you tell me a joke, for example? Uh -huh. This one. It sounds interesting, it sounds boring, it sounds tiring, okay? So we can only change one word or maybe two words and we have some possibilities, but not a lot. These are semi-fixed expressions, okay? So we have the four categories, words, fixed expressions, semi-fixed expressions, and collocations. Now, how do you use this in your classroom? There is one exercise, one task for your students here. Mm -hmm. In this task, we are going to work with the word have. Had a holiday, had an accident, had a chance to, had an idea, had good luck, had a good time, had no doubt, had no effect, had a meal, and had no problem in doing something. What I'm going to ask my students is to create a story with a happy ending using all these expressions, these fixed expressions, these collocations, these chunks of language, okay? So my target will be, or my objective will be, for my students to create a story, but to learn vocabulary in chunks of language, okay? So I'm killing two birds with a stone. I, they are going to be using all these chunks of language. At the same time, they're gonna be creative and remember, teachers, it's very important to contextualize. If we contextualize the words, we are going to get better results because our students are going to think about a story, happy ending, with this vocabulary. Okay, I am contextualizing. Another quick example, find the odd one. Okay, you are already familiar with this kind of exercise. So, for this exercise or this task, we will be using collocations and students need to collocate the word in capital letters with these other words. For example, new, new experience, new job, new food, new potatoes, new baby. All of these words create collocations, but there is only one that doesn't make a strong collocation or a strong word partnership. You need to find it. Well, students need to find it. Did you guess which one? Potatoes, okay? For the next one, you try to find them, teachers, and write them in the comments, okay? Clear attitude, clear need, clear instructions, clear alternative, and clear day. Which one is the odd one? Which one doesn't make a strong collocation? Find it, teachers. Now, how do you use the lexical approach in one lesson? Because I just showed you two types of tasks, quick tasks. But in a lesson, for example, you're teaching reading, reading skills. You do your reading for gist, you do your detailed reading or your, your skimming and scanning, and then you proceed to teach vocabulary, to work with vocabulary. But this time you're gonna be using the lexical approach. That means that students are going to be using chunks of language, not isolated words. Well, the first, uh, sorry, the first exercise is 
check the, the instructions. Find the phrasal verb, which means the same as the following definitions. In this case, my students are working with phrasal verbs because phrasal verbs are chunks of language. Okay. Um, in paragraph six, here I have the reading. The reading that I chose is from the book uh, Extreme Survivors. And it has a lot of wonderful stories about people surviving extreme conditions, a car crash, an airplane crash, like this is the case of an, about an airplane crash. And well, this, this boy that you see over here, he survived the, car, the, the airplane crash and he was the only one. Well, um, like I was saying, we're going to be using phrasal verbs. I give the definition and they need to find the phrasal verb. So they need to understand the definition in order to find the phrasal verb. Here I circle the answers. You obviously cannot read this, but you get the idea. Okay, in paragraph nine, you need to find a phrasal verb that means to tie or bind a person into something. In this case, strapped into. Why? Because the boy, when he was found, he was strapped into his seat. That's how he survived. One of the reasons uh, why he survived. Okay. Well, this is the first exercise. Now, the second one. Analyze the words in bold and answer the questions. In this case, I extracted some other chunks of language, some fixed expressions, collocations, or semi-fixed expressions. Uh -huh. I wrote the complete sentence and, uh, well, that sentence contains the chunks of language. Check, check it out. In paragraph 9, line 4, there is this sentence. It was clear that the passengers stood no chance. The passengers stood no chance. Okay, so they didn't have any possibility. And my question now for students is, can a baby stand a chance of living if he doesn't eat in five days? If my student gets the idea of stand no chance, then he will be able to answer my question. Another question. Uh, well, another sentence. Uh, the aunt flew to break the news of a terrible, of the terrible event. And my question is, what words would you use when you break the news of a terrible event? My students need to answer that question, but for that, they need to analyze the meaning of this chunk of language, okay? So, step number one, you find an interesting reading, then you extract the chunks of language, you analyze the, the reading. It has to be an authentic text, because if you use authentic text, you will find more, um, more relevant chunks of language, okay? Well... You select the reading, then you find some chunks of language, you select them, and then you give students some tasks, okay? Like task number one, working with the meaning. Task number two, uh, having sentences with the chunks of language involved. And the last exercise, mm -hmm. you read, do you remember the exercise I told you about? Well, this is the case, okay? I implemented this in my reading. We have some collocations uh, from the reading. Intensive care and worst disaster. Now students need to read the options and find the want or the words that don't form a strong collocation. We have intensive care, take care, extreme care, and have care. Obviously the want that doesn't make a strong word partnership is have care, we don't use it. And worst disaster, we have natural disaster, recipe for disaster, disaster area, and unstable disaster. Okay, I, get, I guess that you already know the answer, teachers. Please write it in the comments. Okay, so this is the way that we can work with a normal reading. You can work with a listening. You can work with a conversation, anything. The idea is to raise awareness in students about these chunks of language so they can learn vocabulary, uh, but in a faster way, in a more effective way. That is the point about the lexical approach. Well, teachers, this will be all for today. And if you have found this useful, 
please give us a like, subscribe, and don't forget to click on the little bell so you don't miss anything. And don't forget to go to our website, 